Chapter 3, Molecules of Life, Part 5. Now, this is the kind of molecule you may not be familiar with because it is not part of our normal food groups. Nucleic acids are also a molecule type that does some very different things. Whereas all the other things had to do with structure, perhaps, or perhaps with nutrition, nucleic acids are an information molecule. Conceptually, that's a little bit challenging. Because, wait a minute, this is chemistry. How can chemistry have something to do with information? I mean, for information, don't we use disks and hard drives and that kind of stuff? Yes, we do. But it turns out that using nucleic acids for energy is actually more sophisticated than just using disks and hard drives. And in fact, there are people who are currently working on creating the kinds of information storage devices that you and I are all familiar with using DNA, nucleic acids, things like that. Now for us, for the purposes of this discussion, let's just say that nucleic acids are the blueprint, the information based on which everything works in us. They store the information that is used to make proteins. Now one other thing that they do, and that is not trivial, is not only do they hold the information, they are the resource based on which our body functions, but they are also the information that can be passed on from one generation to the next. Most of the discussion of biomolecules centers around what they do and how they work in us, in the here and now, tomorrow and the day before. But macromolecules are an interesting crossover between us and what happens in the future. They are the things that carry the definition of what we are, or who we are, into the next generation. And there is no other molecule that does this. No carbs transfer over, no proteins transfer over, it's just the genetic material that transfers. And so they hold a very special place in this arrangement of chemicals that is used in our bodies. The two types of nucleic acids, perhaps some of these are familiar, perhaps not so familiar, are DNA and RNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. So let's, let's uh, break that down a little bit. Deoxy, deoxyribonucleic acid. Well, so clearly it's a nucleic acid, just as RNA is which is the kind of molecule we're talking about. But specifically, what kind of nucleic acid is it? Well, ribo is for ribose sugar. That's a sugar molecule. And this particular sugar is missing, that's what the D stands if you're dehydrated, right, you're missing water. So deoxy means it's missing oxygen. So DNA is the nucleic acid whose ribose sugar misses an oxygen. That's DNA. Well, RNA then is the nucleic acid with a normal ribose sugar. So again, it's a small difference, but it turns out to be an important one. They also have true monomers, and these monomers are called nucleotides. So now we have the complete set. Monosaccharides are the monomers of carbohydrates. Amino acids are the monomers of proteins. And nucleotides are the monomers of nucleic acids. This is the structure of these nucleotides. They have three components. It's a little bit simpler, perhaps, than what the amino acids had. They had four different things, or five, depending on how you look at it. But they're relatively complex. So first of all, this is the ribose sugar. And in this case, it is the deoxyribose, because here there is an oxy missing. If you look at it, you have carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4, and carbon 5. You, so when you're wondering how does this connect to the next of these 
nucleotides, you can see that there's one connection at carbon 3 and the other connection at carbon 5. That's where they connect. And one connection is to a phosphate group. The phosphate as atom in the middle here can have five covalent bonds. And on the other hand, this one goes back to another phosphate group. So it's always phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, and so on. And in the middle, or to the right here, there on carbon 1, you have this thing called a nitrogenous base. As you can see here, in DNA, there are four different types of nitrogenous bases. Only T is shown here. It's a ring structure. It is a ring structure called a nitrogenous base because it has nitrogens that are built into it. And then, of course, it has functional groups. Here's one carbonyl group. Here's another carbonyl group. So fairly complex, but not too complex. We look at it as a simple molecule. This is sort of the representation where you have the phosphate, where you have the sugar, and then you have the base. So that's the basic structure of these nucleotides. The nitrogenous bases, as I mentioned, come in four flavors. The T is the one we already saw. And for simplicity's sake, we'll tend to look at this as T. Thymine is what it's called, but we're going to deal with the, the letters. And as you see here, there are two categories. This is the category containing a single ring, and this is the category with two ring structures. The single ring structures are the T and the C, and they differ in various ways. Not fundamentally, there's one difference and here's the other. Again, it's a difference in the functional groups. Down here we have adenine and guanine, and they again have differences in the functional groups. So here is one of those differences. Here is another difference, right? But those are again just in the functional groups. Again, relatively minor differences, no huge spatial transformations or anything like that but very important differences. So those are the four nitrogenous bases in DNA, A, G, T, and C. When we put this molecule together now, we will take the nucleotides, the individual nucleotides, and here's one of them. So there's your sugar, I'm sorry, there's your phosphate, there's your sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, and we have sticking out the nitrogenous base, and we call that a sugar phosphate backbone. Question may be, why do we call this a sugar phosphate backbone? Because if I make an analogy now, you can see that in our own body we have a vertebra, we have a disc, we have a vertebra, we have a disc, and so on and so forth, and that's basically how our body is made, right? And muscles are attaching to the bones. So your vertebra are your bones, and the muscles that allow you to move your backbone around, those are the muscles. And so you can see here, the muscle is like the nitrogenous base, the vertebra is like the sugar, and the disc is like the phosphate. And so the clever people who came up with the structure, they said, oh, it looks just like our backbone. And the name stuck. And that's what sometimes happens in science. So if you ever wonder, if you want to remember, just remember your own vertebral column and the bits and pieces that you have on it. And you'll remember the structure of nucle nucleic acids. There is one added piece of this that's important. Since these are information molecules, one thing that's important is that we are able to protect this information, especially when it comes to preserving it for the next generation. So clearly this is important stuff. How do we do this? Now, if you think about our normal data carrying devices, we used to have floppy disks. That was a long time ago. And then we had thumb drives. And we still have thumb drives, but now we have solid state because that's actually more solid and better in terms of keeping information in it. You can, you can run it through the wash, for example, 
which is something that's happened to me. But you want to make sure that your information stays together. And so when it comes to the DNA, it forms a double helix. A double helix is a structure that has two corkscrew shapes. Here's one corkscrew shape, and here's the other. So if we drew this in a independent fashion, it would be one corkscrew and the other corkscrew. And they are cross-connected across these nitrogen spaces by hydrogen bonds. So again, hydrogen bonding, once more, gives us an important structure. But this structure, the hydrogen bonds, are on the inside of the sugar phosphate backbone. So when something moves towards the DNA molecule, it's going to start encountering the sugar phosphate backbone first. And that makes it a pretty tough nut to crack for many chemicals. It's not so easy to get in the middle here. And therefore, it's a very good way of keeping information safe. Now, of course, keeping information safe, our computer information is basically zeros and ones, right? And we have to find ways to store that. The DNA has more to offer than zeros and ones. It has A, C, T, and G to offer. And that, for computing purposes, is going to be uh, a very important difference. Now, DNA contains deoxyribose, as we mentioned before, and that's the one that has a missing oxygen on carbon number two, and it has those four nitrogenous bases, T, A, G, C. In contrast, RNA has a similar structure, but it has two important differences. There, you have that sugar, so this is proper ribose, not deoxyribose. And instead of having a T, I should say no T, but instead it has uracil. Other than that, the nucleotide is the same. So the ribose is there, the T is there, and then one other fundamental difference is it is only a single strand. And because it's only a single strand, you can say, well, that means it must not be one of those molecules that is trying to keep the information safe. But instead, maybe it's got other uses, and you would be exactly right. The uses of this molecule are to carry the information where it is needed. So you can have your DNA, which is like your, your hard drive in your computer, and you want to keep that hard drive there, and you want to make sure it's backed up, and you need to keep it cool, and all that kind of stuff. But then when you want some of the programming, you take your thumb drive, get the file of the program you want, and then you can carry it with you. So the RNA is more like your thumb drive, whereas the DNA is more like your hard drive. And that's one of the fundamental differences between those. And that is the end of chapter three.